evening, everyone. Um, my name is Vera. I believe most of our viewers know me and also know We Working Women. Um, before I start tonight's uh, interview and conversation, I'd like to inter introduce a little bit about We Working Women and our company, Celebration Tech Inc. So Celebration is a women-led um, tech company based here in Toronto, Canada. And um, we are coming from a community-based um, platform called We Working Women. And it's being the seventh year this year, a big celebration gonna be happening this year. Um, so we are a platform that focus on overseas Chinese women. And we're going to um, have a lot of like academy courses and live stream events. And we have uh, memberships and different clubs. So today I'm very excited to have our guest tonight. And we, as we all know that in March, We Working Women's theme is women empowerment. So in this month, we invited so many wonderful, amazing women leaders to come to our platforms and share their um, experiences, their stories, their inspirations. So tonight I'm really, really honored to have Heather here. Say hi to everyone, Heather. Hi everyone, very excited to be here. Yes, so before I start the real conversation, I'm going to give a very quick introduction to our audience about Heather. Um, so as the CEO of Fora, um, Heather's career is built around improving the livelihoods of women and girls. So both at home in Canada and around the world. So prior to joining Fora, she managed a complex multi-country girls' education and women's health interventions across Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America for Right to Play and Care Canada. Just by reading by this part, I have goosebumps. Those are all the places I really wanted to go, <laughs> <laughs> especially Africa. I really want to talk about that later, maybe. So she also has the unique experience of having worked in cooperate relations and strategic partnerships with the Vancouver Organizing Committee for the 10, uh, 2010 Olympic and Paralympic Games, an activist for women's and girls' rights, poverty reduction, and senior citizen care. You are everywhere, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> so Heather has volunteered for the King Club, the YMCA, the CARE, Holiday Helpers, and the Invictus Games. So Heather, we're so honored to have you tonight. And then um, we, we, uh, just as I introduced that you are the CEO of Fora Network for, for Change. And many of our audience, the Chinese community, we don't really, um, we're not really familiar about Fora and its work. So can you tell us a little bit about Fora, this networking uh, organization, who is Fora and what exactly do you do? Absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of your audience tuning in tonight um, or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are, um, to listen to this discussion. It's really a privilege for me. So Fora Network for Change is a Canadian-based, globally active charity. We operate a number of leadership programs, and then we do a lot of advocacy around supporting young women. And one of the reasons that we exist and are sort of our story is because our founder, her name is Farah Mohammed. Um, once upon a time in 2009, the G20 was coming to Toronto. Uh, and she, I mean, we all know that when we think of the G20, it's just a picture of a bunch of men standing there and Angela Merkel for many years. So it was like men and Angela Merkel. Um, and she knew that, and she knew that it would be very male dominated. And she also knew that it was a real space of power. It's where decisions were gonna be made. And so when she founded the organization, she said, we need to have young women's voices at this table as well. And so what she did was she created a global summit where she would bring young women from all of the G20 countries, as well as other um, countries. And they would come together for their own summit where they would put together a communique with a suite of policy recommendations for the G20 leaders. And then they would have an audience with many of those leaders and they would push to have their recommendations adopted by the G20. 
Um, over the years, it, at that time, actually, we were called Girls 20, which made sense because it was very much in alignment with the G20. Over the years, um, as an organization, we grew and evolved. And as we grew and evolved, what we realized was that there was a lot of um, uh, desire to have us participate in a lot of different spaces. So we had we would get calls from UN women, you know, G7 roundtables. Can you come and speak about the policies that your young female leaders have created? And can they come and talk about why it's important that those policies are included? And so we shifted from being, you know, an organization that just focused on the G20 summit to being one that um, has a number of leadership programs specifically designed for young women and then also um, works in what we call spaces of power. So we go and we try to change the status quo in those spaces so that, you know, decisions about young women are being made with young women. So that's really the advocacy part. And then we just, yeah, have some really great leadership um, programs that we do with, with young women, both again at Can in Canada and around the world. Sounds really exciting. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you are now the CEO of FARA. So well, what is that a, um, a CEO of a nonprofit organization does? And um, how is it similar or different from a corporate CEO role? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, my at this point, I think I've worked in the nonprofit sector for like 18 years um, and I have never had a corporate job. So I actually can't say what they would really do day to day. But I imagine much of it is very similar. You know, when you're the CEO of a, of a nonprofit, it's actually a registered corporation. So you are operating a registered corporation, you have to take care of all of the, the governance required within that corporation, the HR, the finances, you know, the, the for us, the product is our programs. Um, and just really making sure that, you know, all aspects of the organization function smoothly. You're then also, as the CEO, really responsible for working with your board of directors and your team to really develop a strategy for the organization and put that strategy in place. Um, so I think probably from a day-to-day -day perspective, quite similar. I think the main difference would be it's a different bottom line. I think if you're running a corporate entity for profit, you got to make sure you have a profit. <laughs> so that's probably your bottom line. It's probably the thing you're most focused on. Um, and I wouldn't know the first thing about turning a profit um, within a company. Uh, and then on my side, what's most important is making sure that the program participants, our community, um, is feeling that our work is having a real impact on them. And so a lot of my job is making sure that our programs are excellent, that our community feels cared for, that they feel like we're having the type of impact we want to see. And then we work with a lot of different stakeholders. So from our donors to our board of directors, to our alumni, to our program participants, to our team, lots of different stakeholders so it's really just making sure managing all those stakeholders and making sure that you know everybody feels the organization is having the impact it should be having wow it sounds like a lot of work to do like all the ceos <laughs> <laughs> yes this is a busy job <laughs> yeah i know you i mean heather you look um so young and energetic um and now you already a ceo of such a big um, network organization so we'd really love to hear about your career journey. Like, how did you get interested in developing a career in the nonprofit sector and making a like a social impact with your work? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm not that young, but thank you. Um, <laughs> um, you can see all the crow's feet coming in now. Uh, you know what's interesting? I um, my parents. We're both nurses. So my dad was an ER nurse and he worked in the emergency room for all my life. And my mom was an OR nurse and she worked in the operating room. Um, and I think when you're raised by people who love their work and believed in their work and believed in the value of their work, you kind of see how important it is to maybe follow in those footsteps. Now, I can't even look at blood without passing out. So I've been a terrible nurse. So it was never going to be medicine for me. But 
what I knew that I cared about was seeing how I could support other people, how I could, you know, be in a sphere of assistance to others. I didn't really think you could turn that necessarily into a career, or I didn't really have an understanding of that. Um, but from a very young age, like 13, 14, I was already volunteering in a lot of spaces. And I think that when I started to see in those volunteer capacity, um, the type of work you could do, then I thought, you know, I have to, I have to approach um, my schooling as if I want to get into the charitable sector. And that's what I did. And it actually worked out really well. And so, um, yeah, so from there, I, you know, do you want the rundown of sort of the, what the careers look like? Yeah, absolutely. That will be, um, I think, very helpful for our audience to actually know, like the career path you take to like what really leads on for like for uh, this organization as a nonprofit um, organization that you finally decided to join with. Wonderful. So yeah, so my first job was working actually for a consultancy firm that supported nonprofits. Um, and then from there, I got the job at the Olympics and the Olympic Organizing Committee is a nonprofit organization. It's obviously not there to make a profit. Um, when I worked for the games in Vancouver, I was there for three years. And it was actually really incredible. Well, it was an incredible opportunity, no matter what. I got to, you know, be at the gold medal hockey game and all that exciting stuff. But what I really took from it was what it looked like when people loved and cared about what they do. I thought it was very cool, but I didn't like have the passion for it that they had, that so many people who work there had. And, and they've, they, so many of them are still working in the games uh, arena. So I really took from there, you know, you can find a job that you have tons of passion for and pays the bills to some degree. It's not going to pay the bills the way it would in the corporate sector, though, <laughs> I'll tell you that much, but still, it still pays the bills for the, for the most part. Um, so from there, I actually ended up um, backpacking around South America for I don't know, six months or something. And when I was doing that, I um, saw some of the work that CARE, well, it was CARE International, but there was some CARE Canada work there too, um, was doing. And they were really doing some great maternal newborn child health work. Um, I just thought that was incredible, you know, the the fact that you know, this international organization was able to support these local community hospitals in a really meaningful way. Um, so when I returned to Canada, I moved to Ottawa and I got a job at CARE. I was very lucky. I started off in the fundraising marketing um, side of things, communication side of things. And then I ended up moving over to the programs. And when I moved over to the programs side, um, that's when I really found my passion. Like I loved that work. I thought it was so... I thought it was just such a privilege to be able to, you know, work with people in Canada and then I would get on a plane and I would go and support these country offices and I would just have this very, um, you know, great experience in working with so many incredible people around the world and I just thought that that was the coolest. Um, and it was hard work, you know, and it was a very, very challenging work, but I knew that it was important to me to keep doing it. And so I was at CARE for about three years. And then from there, I went to um, Right to Play. And I was there for, I think, a little over three years. And with Right to Play, very similarly, was really working kind of around the world um, in many places, uh, supporting the country offices and really implementing the programs and, and, and running the grants. And, you know, oftentimes I think people thought, you know, I'd be out, um, in these countries, like actually doing the, the the programs, but I wasn't. I was typically in the country office, like helping them on use Excel spreadsheets. But like it was so, it was such great, interesting, phenomenal work, and I loved it. Um, I think when I did it, though, what I really recognized was that there was this, you know, a lot of support and funding. Never enough, but a lot of support and funding for girls' education. There was a lot of support and funding for maternal newborn child health, um, women's economic empowerment. And I felt like there was just a gap. There was just a clear gap of programs that were actually for young women. There just it just didn't seem to exist. Um, and so, you know, and when I say young women, I sort of mean 18 to 25. And I think we all know 
what formative years 18 to 25 is for all of us. I had always known what for and now at the time girls 20 had been up to and I always thought that the program that they had was really interesting. And so yeah, after I'd been at right to play for a little over three years, there was a position, interestingly, a director position of programs came up at um, Fora, and I um, applied for that. And then I came for a couple of interviews. And in my second interview, I was getting asked all sorts of strategic questions, like questions about what kind of strategy I'd put in place for the organization. And I'm like, as the director of programs, I guess I would do the following. Anyways, I called in and said, would you consider the CEO position? So I was very, very lucky to get that. And I've been doing that for five years now. Wow, so impressive. You've done so much <laughs> intensively, I mean. You know, I, I I personally actually started my early career um, from the Olympic too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So I was involved in the uh, 2008 Beijing Olympic Games yes. for yes. two years. So it was a lot of work to do, a lot of coordination. Um, preparation until we receive all the athletes, you know, like and make sure everything went smooth. Yes. But it's also like it's so fundamental to help you to build basically every aspect of your career, you know, how to network, how to talk yeah. to people, you know, communication skills and troubleshooting skills, that every skill you need <laughs> to get under a lot of pressure at the same time. And to be excellent at troubleshooting. <laughs> All sorts yeah. of things happen that you cannot prepare for, and then you've got to figure it out on the spot. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I was really thankful for that two years experience yeah, as well. So, um, so, we all heard that in your career, you have worked um, extensively in international development, right? And not just domestically here. So, and promoting um, gender uh, equality. So can you share some of the stories of how like working in the nonprofit space has been especially rewarding for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, (laughs) I think that when you grow up the way I grew up. So I'm from a suburb of Vancouver. My parents were nurses, middle income family. Um, we never traveled anywhere. I, you know, didn't get to experience a ton of diversity in my life. Um, I think that when I got into international development and when I was able to go to these spaces, um, it wasn't national geographic. It was real life. It was real people. It was incredibly, um, beautiful, complicated, interesting places full of culture. And um, I don't know. And I just, it always felt like such a privilege to be in any of those spaces. And I always um, very quickly understood the impacts of things like colonialism and the impact of ongoing you know, reality of colonialism in so many places that I was in. Um, And then I think that just the opportunity to work in those communities and get to know some of the people from those communities was really life-changing for me. And, you know, I, I, I often say that one of the reasons I, I, you know, love the work we do at Fora is because it didn't matter where I went. It didn't matter if I was in, Peru, Thailand, uh, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, it didn't matter where I was. I would speak to young women, I would speak to girls, I would speak to women, and they all wanted so much of the same thing, which was to have healthy, thriving communities, which was to have a say in how things become healthy and thriving, which was to have that seat at the table in a very real way. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I remember doing a, um, uh, I was working on a girls education project in Ghana and I met this young woman and she was just, um, Kainini and she was just so amazing. Like she, everything she said was making me laugh. She was so smart. She had, you know, um, was clearly the class president, was clearly gonna be an amazing um, leader of Ghana one day. And, you know, once we got through, I was doing a bit of monitoring and evaluation work with her and, you know, was doing an interview with her. And once we got through it, she said, now take this back to Canada and get them to understand 
what it's actually like here. And I said, I will do my best. <laughs> I'll take this and do what I can with it. And I just loved that, that, that confidence that she had, the point she was making that, you know, people think we're one way here and we're not. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and, and I just, again, like it was just such a huge privilege for me to meet so many young women like that. So many girls like that, so many women like that. And I think that that's, that's why, you know, I, I knew I had to do this work and I, and I have so many stories and of, of the, that feeling that way and having that, um, feeling like the work was having an impact with people. And I guess I always just, when people kind of say, you know, I would love to go somewhere like that. I'm like, do it, go. It's amazing. You're going to have an incredible time. You're going to meet funny, interesting people. You're going to meet jerks just like you will everywhere in the world. You're going to be like, you're going to have a great time. And I think that that is so important for all of us to go and meet those people and make those stories ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, we all know that you have recently become a mother. (laughs) <laughs> tell us about it yeah well you know she's very funny uh <laughs> yeah, her name is Elijah she'll be two in May um yeah I mean I waited a little bit later in life to have her um and then is sort of the typical age that you have kids and um part of the reason was because you know I had these jobs that took me all over the world 200 days a year yeah. that um, wasn't going to be that easy to stay at home. <laughs> um, but you know, you have, uh, for me, having a child's just been exactly what I thought it would be fun, hard, full of joy. She makes me laugh every single day. And, you know, it's been interesting. People have sort of said, oh, you're going to want to work less or you're going to want to do things differently or it gives you new priorities. And I sort of think maybe that depends what you were doing before. I mean, if anything, having a little girl has made me double down on how important the work that Fora does, how important it is for women to have a voice, meaningful voice in every decision-making space. You know, I would love for her to grow up in a world where it does not make a difference that she's a girl. Mm -hmm. And we're not there yet. And so if anything, having her has just made me only further understand the importance of continuing, keeping our foot on the gas as it relates to anything in the sort of the women's movement and the women's sector, because I think it's just so incredibly important for us to continue to work our hardest to make sure that the next few generations have a different experience than we've had. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's so so beautiful. I have a daughter too. Um, she's six years old. I actually I have three kids. <laughs> oh, this one is uh, eleven. He's turning twelve, and I have uh, twins. So they're boy and a girl. Um, so um, because this month is like Women's History Month, right? So we mm-hmm. started this conversation earlier this month with I. I started this conversation with my uh, my twins because they are like the younger ones, right? about like how important it is. Cause my boy was complaining, like, why is there an international women's day? Why boys are not celebrated, right? <laughs> He's like, it's not fair. Like <laughs> we don't have our festivals. So I have to explain to them why, like on, there, there are so many places, so many countries in the world that girls that don't have the same right. And they were so surprised to hear that. Like yeah. girls don't deserve to go to school. They don't deserve to go to, you know, have good education and good life or just simple choices. Yes. And they were really surprised to hear that. And I think really important for the younger generation to know that it's like here in Canada, yes, we're being like voicing out um, about gender equality and, and a lot of, you know, like um, uh, inclusiveness, but there are so many places out there that really needs the balance and needs a voice um, in the world. So I, I think it's really nice um, that what you've been doing for this. <laughs> this well, thank you. And you know what, when I have, I mean, I often, you know, I'm in spaces where um, 
maybe it is mostly Canadian children. And I often say, you know, in the world, what do you think Canada would rank on a gender equality um, index? And I think most people would say top 10, we'd be a top 10 country. Mm -hmm. But this year on the World Economic Forum's ranking, we're 24th. Wow. And we're 24th because we actually lag behind in many different indicators. Mm -hmm. And so I always sort of think to people, I know, I know it might feel like we've achieved some equality here. And I know that we've had made huge strides and I never want to take away the work that, you know, my predecessors have done to get us to where we are. Mm -hmm. But we are still not an equal society here. We still have a lot of work to do. And I think that especially as it relates to economic empowerment of women. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, um, when you are a women's activist, <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you know, my Twitter and other sort of public spaces, uh, you do get a lot of questions about, you know, why is there no men's day? There is, it's November 19th. Um, but one of the reasons it's not that celebrated is because we're still in a system that we understand to be fairly patriarchal. And I think that, you know, when you think about who our leaders are, you know, when you think about who the CEOs of our major companies are, I mean, it's still, you know, as we always say, um, uh, male, pale and stale. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> It is what it is. And so I think that we do have to absolutely keep our foot on the pedal and on the gas. And I think we also have to acknowledge too in Canada that when we're often talking about who's achieving gender equality, it's women who look like me, you know, it's not women of color. It's not um, first generation women. And so there's tons of work to be done. And I think that we have to continue to do the work here and we have to keep, continue to do the work around the world. Yeah. I mean, um, if we just like not even looking um, like looking at globally, if we just look here in Canada, um, like we working women, our platform. So we're an organization of uh, mostly Chinese women, but uh, many of them are building their careers here in Canada and around the world. Um, so as ethnic uh, minorities and new immigrants, oftentimes we feel really alone you know, in the challenges that we confront. And it's not just about, uh, I mean, like the societies and stuff. It's also about like how um, we as a group, as women who, you know, need to thrive work and family all together in a new culture, the new world, how we adapt ourselves to. That's why it's so important you have we working women, right? Like you've you've created a platform and a space, like a real community space for a group who needs that community space. So that's why I'm happy to be here to chat. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So can you tell us? Um, so what are some of the uh, key skills you think young women professionals need to focus more on building to advance themselves in leadership positions? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's so many important skills to get at a young age. Like I said, that 18 to 25 is very formative for us. It's when we kind of learn how we work and how well we work with others. Um, and we really try to offer those who are in our programs a lot around confidence building, negotiations, you know, it's really important that young women learn how to negotiate and how to negotiate so that they don't feel like they've been taken advantage of. Um, we do a lot around professional communications and the importance of being able to communicate effectively. Um, and I think that, you know, like within most of our programs, we really just kind of look at what that particular group has said they need. So they'll come to us and they'll say, like, I don't know a lot about finance in an organization. Like, can we do a uh, session on finance? Absolutely. Can we do a session on um, leadership? Absolutely. Like, what does it look like to actually lead a group? What does that mean? You know, um, and I always tell people like, because I lead some of these workshops and I'll say to them, you need to understand that a lot of us don't really have a clue what we're doing. My first day doing this job, I literally Googled, what does a CEO do? Cause I wasn't really sure what they do all day long. So I was like, what does a CEO actually do day in and day out? And I said, so one of the reasons we focus a lot on confidence is to get them to understand that everybody 
has confidence challenges. Everybody isn't really sure if they're doing a good job, if they belong in a space. And so, yeah, we're really big on, on trying to give them what we call hard skills and essential skills. People love to say soft skills, but actually I would say that nobody's going to be successful without those essential skills. Um, and so all of our programming focuses on those kind of two things, hard skills, negotiations, finance, understanding governance and spaces, essential skills, communications, confidence, you know, there's, there's quite a few, but it's, it's really important that they have that balance. And I think that when we think of who's been the best leaders we've had, it's people who have both in spades. Mm -hmm. um, so just a quick reminder for our live stream audience, if you have any questions for Heather, uh, you're more than welcome to drop off your question. Uh, we're going to have a short Q&A session after uh, our conversation. So uh, please don't hesitate <laughs> to leave your question. Um, so moving on, um, when you mentioned about um, like for young women, you know, like professionals, um, they do need a lot of help, um, a lot of, I, I think, access and resources to actually gain their skills, all kinds of skills. Is there anything that you can recommend? Like how, like, how did you get all the skills? Did you take any courses or find any mentors? You know? you know what? It's kind of a combination of things. I think you have your academic background, which provides you some great writing skills and other skills. Then I think you get a few jobs and you learn the hard way through things, how to do some things. If you're fortunate, and I always hope people are, you find not only a mentor, but a sponsor, like a person who's really willing to put your name forward in a lot of spaces, um, but is also willing to give you honest uh, feedback and feedback that you're able to take and, and action. I think that that's really important. One of the reasons that we think for us such an important organization is because every single time, like without fail. When I meet a woman who is 10, 15, 20 years into her career, without fail, she will say, I wish I had something like this when I was younger. Aww. Because we all get into these spaces and we're like, Ooh, are we doing a good job? Do we belong here? Um, yeah. So I think that if you don't have access to something like Fora, absolutely finding a mentor finding a good leader. Like if you, if you are able to find a good boss, I think that that goes a really long way. Um, finding a community. So there's lots of great communities out there where I think you can learn quite a bit. We Working Women is obviously an incredible community. Um, and one that when you're a part of it, you, you get access to those resources, to, you know, hearing talks that are helpful for you, meeting people who can be mentors for you. So I think that that's really important. And then finally, yeah, absolutely. There's so many free courses out there. Take them when you can and see how they support the development of your skills, especially when you're a younger person who's really looking to build those. Mm -hmm. And just be open to things. I really, I feel like um, you can't say yes to everything, obviously, but there's so much value in being brave in your career. And it really goes a long way. You know, when I started doing international development work, I would hear from people all the time, like, Aren't you scared going? Because I also did humanitarian work. So going to humanitarian disaster spaces, like, aren't you scared doing that? Aren't you, you know, what is it like being there? And it's like, it's incredibly challenging and often so sad to be in those spaces. But in saying yes to those opportunities, for lack of a better word, I also got to understand the world in such a deeper more meaningful way that I am so grateful for. And it has given me perspective and the value of perspective is huge. And so, yeah, be brave, say yes to things that scare you, do them, do them poorly, know that you've done them poorly <laughs> and then resolve <laughs> to do them better next time. Um, but yeah, I think community, finding the right courses, finding a mentor, all of those go a long way. Mm -hmm. Well, well, for your summary, I, I, I just basically feel we have everything on We Working Women. 
Yes. So we have a great community to support them. And we have so many like courses, soft skills, hard skills to help them. And also um, uh, this year, we are actually developing one of our app feature function is to um, matching mentor and mentees. Amazing. So, yeah. So um, we, we have a uh, club called Milestone Club. So it's actually for young women professionals. Um, so for them to connect with each other, but also have access to get mentors. Um, is there like other, because because we realized that we, the, the needs, the basic needs is that we don't really have anything um, in, especially in the Chinese community here in North America, um, which can, you know, offer them um, some like help for uh, mentorship. So for, what about for your um, part of the world? Like, do you have any advice um, for like young women professionals to get mentors? Like how to find a mentor or a sponsor? Yeah, it is. So it is challenging. There is some great organizations out there. Of course, I'm drawing a blank on um, the one that I'm thinking of, but a lot of them do mentorship. Like I think YWCA's do a lot of mentorship programs. Um, so there is programs out there. I bet you could Google it and come across them. My only caveat to that is that the value of a mentor is someone you share a lot of chemistry with, like someone who, you know, you are comfortable taking feedback from. So it can't just kind of be anybody. Mm -hmm. What I would say, and I to come back to my point a minute ago about being brave, when you are in a space and you meet you, you know, usually an older woman um, who you have been impressed with, who you think you might have that chemistry with, don't be afraid to ask them for mentorship support. What I have realized, especially like we put out, um, we as an organization will put out calls for mentors for different programs and we get tons of response. Like I would say a lot of women really do, especially once they're more established and feel like they've learned a lot, they wanna share that learning. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanna share it in a very uh, respectful, almost peer to peer kind of way. They want to learn from young women. They think young women often have, and they're right, mm -hmm. bring very interesting new perspectives, fresh perspectives. So they want to do um, very reciprocal types of mentorship. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that what's really important is that if you do come across a woman who really meets the criteria that I talked about, the chemistry, doing interesting work that you want to be doing, ask them, ask them if they'd be willing to mentor you mm -hmm. and have a plan for that mentorship. Say, you know, I'd want to do six sessions. I want to talk about these different things in those sessions. I want to make sure we're covering off on the following. And then at the end of it, uh, I would love for you to reach out to a few people and let them know about me because I'm interested in working at their organization. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and also, I, I think uh, personally, I have, um, I think LinkedIn is a really nice platform um, to connect uh, with people that you're aiming to connect, you know, um, I've often um, get asked for just a coffee chat um, from mostly I would say yes, if it's a young like women asking for, you know, professional advices, I would say yes, let's meet. And then we're going to meet over a Zoom call. Um, so they will uh, usually like I ask them to list questions they wanted to ask specific, specifically. And then um, I'm helping also in a social media group in India, actually. Oh. So they're a very um, young women group and they all want to develop their career in social media, um, like a specialist. Um, so I've been uh, mentoring them and I think um, they really like eager to learn and they, that this is a really a great way to help them. Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. Good for you, that's fantastic. <laughs> So I think, yeah, LinkedIn could be a, a good um, uh, platform to reach out as well. It is. I get lots of messages. And I, similarly to you, like I do really try to make the time to speak to everyone who messages me. I do a fair amount of these talks, so sometimes it's a lot. <laughs> but, but I do my best to make time for everybody because I do think it's so important. Yeah. And also, um, um, I think our app is also like 
in the developing <laughs> process right now. We're actually in beta pick, uh, testing right now uh, for the function of Coffee Chat, like a virtual, um, like an app. So they can matching mentor and mentee um, based on their uh, criteria. So I'm really like very excited when it comes out. We would love to have you. <laughs> love to be. <laughs> um, so um, back to the uh, professional um, related um, conversation, what kinds of demands or conditions uh, should be expected from organizations we work? So when we're looking for a nourishing, when you said, you know, like some, most of the time, maybe your boss or your leader are the mentor, right? Because they know yeah. you, you work together side by side. So what, what kind of um, like conditions are we looking for, um, you know, if we want a really nourishing professional environment? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, this has evolved a lot, actually, even in the last few years. I think there used to be very much the mindset from organizations that people were lucky to have jobs with them. And I think that's really changing. I think people are starting to say, actually, you're lucky to have me. <laughs> so, you know, we have to kind of look at it again from a reciprocal sort of perspective. Um, and with that in mind, I think that when you are entering, especially when you're younger, new workspaces, you should have expectations around a number of things. One of those things is, you know, clear professional development um, support. So, you know, they've offered you time um, off to go do courses, they'll help pay for courses. Um, those are really important. Also seeing how the organization itself invests in its people. Are they providing trainings? Are those trainings quality of quality? Um, I think it's really important. And then at the end of the day, probably the most important, especially for women, um, is really true work-life balance. Like I really believe that like so many jobs in my career, there's just been this expectation that you'll work whenever we need you to work. And it hasn't brought the best out of me. And when I've had the opportunity to lead this organization, I'm very clear with my team that, you know, we work flexible hours. You work when it makes sense, you make sure you get your job done, that works. I won't be calling you on the weekends to do something that does not need to be done on the weekends. You won't be receiving emails from me saying this has to happen. Like really setting up a space where I know that I'm not going to burn them out because what's the point of that? And, and how does that really support the organization? Um, so, yeah, so I really believe that, you know, having expectations around work life. And I always tell young women when they're going into an interview, ask at the end, how they support a real work-life balance, ask how they support real professional development, ask if they have mentorship programs, what they have in place, especially for young women. Is any of it designed with a gender equity lens? Do they understand that young women might need a different sort of mentorship than young men do? You know, all of those types of things I think are really important to go in and expect with, with any organization that you're starting with. Yeah, I, I really love um, the way how you said they really should ask because, you know, most time for women, especially for Asian culture, like for Chinese culture, we're really shy to ask because yeah. we think asking is just demanding, you know, and we try to keep ourselves quiet. So I think asking is so important um, to make their voice count, um, you know, like it, 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 asking now be a little bit maybe embarrassed better than you know you regret your invest like six <laughs> months in, in this like organization later on yeah. so yeah I, I i really love that um we do need to ask how they support us um professionally in our career um yeah. And you get to expect that they that they will support you. I think that that's really important. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right that asking can be very scary for people. Um, and as you said, if in your culture, maybe specifically, it's not seen as something you would you would encourage um, people to do in the past. But what I would say is that a lot of leaders, I think, will. Um, be quite impressed when you push them to answer tough questions. Uh, and I think it helps set up really good boundaries very early on. 
and boundaries are very important. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So at um, FARA, uh, what type of, type of programs um, do you offer to support young women professionals and uh, aspiring leaders? Yeah, so we have a few programs. Um, so we have a program called Girls on Boards, where we place young women on nonprofit boards across Canada to develop their leadership skills and to bring a really fresh perspective to nonprofit boards. Um, we provide them with three months of training in advance. It's very in-depth training. And once they're done, they're placed as full voting members on a nonprofit board. So they learn what it looks like to operate on a board, a real board. Um, and that's a really great program that we just offer in Canada. Then we have our Global Summit, which is a program that we do um, each year. We didn't do one last year, just by virtue of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but this year it'll be in Toronto. We put out a call for applications around the world. And we're really looking to identify the most, um, I don't even wanna use the word impressive. We're looking to identify young women leaders around the world that we know are going to take what they learn, the platform we provide, the training, and they're going to go back to their communities and make change in their communities. Um, we have some other smaller programs that we put on, but also we're going to be launching uh, an online platform in the next couple of months where anybody can come and access our courses that we have, our workshops that we do. We put on a lot of different webinars when, you know, so we'll be doing, um, a webinar soon around um, climate change and activism, for example. Uh, so people can come and learn about all kinds of different um, ways that you're able to be a leader, that you're able to make change in different spaces. Uh, and anybody can be a part of that. So we'll be launching that soon and anybody can come and be a part of it. Wow, sounds amazing. I want to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm be a part of it. <laughs> So, um, so uh, we talked a lot about like women, uh, like young women professionals. So what about women led businesses, you know, for those who want to like give back and they um, want to even like create their own businesses um, to try to help empower other women through Fora? Um, how do you like suggest that, that they can think about making a positive impact? Yeah, I mean, I think whether it's us or another charity that's focused on women's empowerment or supporting women, um, I think that if you are a women-led business, if you believe in the value of supporting young women, you know, you can always reach out to organizations and say, like, here's what we can provide. Sometimes it's funding, which is always we always need funding. Uh, sometimes it's funding, sometimes it's employee time, sometimes it's a product that you've developed. So I'll give you an excellent example. Diva Cup is a menstrual product um, that they reached out to us and said, we'd like to support you with some funding because we love the work that you're doing. We'd also like to send you our product. And if you could, you know, you can give out the product for free. It's generally a fairly expensive product and it's not for everybody. We totally appreciate not everybody would want to use a diva cup necessarily but it was such an easy simple way to support our work funding here's our product you know here you go and i think that similarly we'll hear from uh, marketing professionals who will say uh you know we don't necessarily have funding to give you but we would be able to give you um 100 man hours women hours uh, to, support, <laughs> to support, um, you know, a marketing campaign that you need to do, we'll put it together for you. So there's things like that, 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 you know, women led businesses can certainly do. And then I think just looking internally at themselves, what are they doing as an organization to support the women who are within it? Because just because you're women led doesn't mean that you support women. So Let's, you know, I think we've all had a, a bad woman boss at one point in our lives who does not support other women. Uh, so I just want to be clear on that, that, you know, you have to be intentional about it. You have to be able to actually answer what activities you undertake to be a good place for women to work at. Um, and then I think that, you know, after you've looked internally, you can look externally on how you're able to really support the women's movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have um, here um, in the live stream chat box, I have a very interesting question. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
so it says having a supportive relationship is making a big difference in women's lives. Ambitious women like me <laughs> have a hard time finding their the right romantic partner who will support their goals. Do you have experience or like advice for this matter? <laughs> <laughs> on how to meet the right partner. Uh, you know what? I did not meet my partner till I was 33 years old, maybe uh -huh. almost 34. So I was quite a bit older. <laughs> um, and it's funny. I remember it attending a talk, gosh, years and years ago. And it was a very powerful woman. I won't say who it was, but a very powerful woman on stage. And somebody said to her, like, you know, what's kind of the, the most important decision you've made to get you where you are. And she said, I picked the right partner. And I remember somebody saying, you know, it's not very feminist. And, and she said, it's actually the most feminist thing you could do. Yeah. Like if you plan to have a partner, you better pick someone, you know, is going to rise up and do the job with you <laughs> because you can't <laughs> Self, you absolutely need someone who's putting in 50 50 and who knows sometimes they got to put in 60 and you're putting in 40 like there's <laughs> you know it's truly truly important so I don't know like and I I mean again I didn't meet my partner till quite a bit later and than most of my friends did um and maybe part of that reason was because I was really waiting for somebody that I knew understood how important my work was to me understood that I would never um, not do this work, whether there was children involved or not. Um, and not only respected that about me, but I needed someone who loved that about me because, you know, respect is important, but they have to kind of enjoy the fact that you do what you do. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if I have a good answer to that, but I would <laughs> say that, uh, being crystal clear about what you want and need, um, goes a long way early on. It's not that different than asking the right questions in an interview, right? It helps <laughs> boundaries early on that you then can adhere to for hopefully the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> thank you for your answer. Uh, personally, I think you should just like be ready at any time in your life, no matter it's in your early 20s or even, you know, you're too busy for an, a romantic relationship and you're already in your 30s, but just be ready and get ready and know what you want. Yes. And I yeah, eventually you will meet one. <laughs> like I told you, go be brave. <laughs> you gotta be brave <laughs> with it. So okay. We have another question here. Uh it says, does FARA have programs that are appropriate for newcomers, Chinese young women to Canada, especially women who are trying to build their careers in a new country? So we don't um have any yet uh there is some great organizations out there like newcomer women's services they're based in toronto they do some great programs around that we are looking to partner with organizations like that sooner than later um mostly because i think we have some great courses training um platforms networks that we would love to share um with other organizations who have um, the direct, like who already have the, the community of newcomers within it. Um, but it is also a group that we would like to do better work with and for. Um, so we literally just hired someone last week um, who herself is a newcomer. Um, and one of the reasons that we were so keen to hire her was because she said she really felt she knew what kind of program she wanted to do for newcomers. Um, so, yeah, so, so we hope to get there. We're not, I wouldn't say we're um, uh, very strong at that yet. And I would also say that beyond hoping that we do some of that programming for ourselves, I also want to partner with organizations who are already doing it and see how we can just better support them. Yeah, I think that will be a, a really good approach uh, to just partnership with um, organizations that's already been doing that. Um, organizations like We Working Women, <laughs> yeah, you we know. help newcomers as well. <laughs> we focus on women. Uh, yeah. I think, um, yeah, together we can all make um, an impact, especially for newcomers, right? Like I, I personally moved to Canada six years ago. Um, I stayed in Montreal for five years in a very French environment. And it's just like, you know, the way how I speak English, I was so confident when I moved to Canada thinking, okay, it's another English speaking country, no problem. And then bam, everything French. Like yes. I, I hop on the subway. I have no idea where I'm going to. 
<laughs> so there's so many obstacles for newcomers and they do need a lot of help. Yes, absolutely. for sure. Uh, we have another question here it says, um, can girls from China or, you know, not in Canada join in FARA programs? Uh, so they can join, so young women, so 18 to 24 can join our global summit. Um, it's an application process. We actually just finished it for this year. So it'll be open next year. Uh, we always have young women from China who are part of it. Always incredible. Um, you know, doing really interesting work in China um, and often um, having to participate sort of through VPNs and that sort of thing, because it can always be a bit sort of tricky. But when we bring them, because we get them all together, um, I always love meeting our Chinese delegates because they're very smart, very interesting, doing great work in their communities. So yeah, so that's that's kind of the group that we work with in China now. Um, and then we're always hoping to grow our programs so that more young women can be a part of it because it's a fairly small group right now um, from China specifically. Mm -hmm. So are there any, um, they keep um, the question opening, what's the requirements for women um, from China or even outside of Canada to join the, the global summit? Yeah, so there's quite a few. Um, it's all on our website. Um, and you will see that, you know, it tends to be what we're always looking for is young women who are have already demonstrated that they're leaders, that they have leadership potential um, by virtue of the leadership work they've already been doing. And we don't consider leadership just a fancy title that you've had at your job, not at all. Leadership is, you know, in my community, um, we recognized that, um, like, I'll actually, I'll give you a very specific example that I loved. Um, one of the young women in our program knew that, um, uh, I don't know what you would call them old folks homes, <laughs> but senior, citizens homes, senior, senior, senior homes. homes, homes, but people often, yeah. also. so a senior citizen home that they had no volunteer, um, uh, sort of programs in place and there was nobody going in there to help them with anything that might be of uh, support to them. And so she developed one and she just, you know, with her and her friends, she just put together, you know, this great thing where they would go and play cards with them and they'd go do games with them. And to me, that's leadership. Like she didn't need a fancy title. She knew there was an issue. She decided how to solve it. She worked with a number of stakeholders to do so. And she put something in place that was sustainable. Um, so yeah, so it's those types of things that we look for. And then there's an age requirement. Um, just because it's hard to design programs for really large age groups that then become to stay meaningful for a really large age group. Um, so yeah, so that one we keep about 18 to 24. Mm -hmm. So um, so FARA as a nonprofit sector, um, I have like one question about like a nonprofit sector, like the organizations, a lot of new Canadians, you know, they trying to find some ideas or inspirations of uh, charitable, given relatively, um, you know, this whole idea is very new to them. Mm -hmm. um, can you share your advice, like for someone who want to make a positive impact in this world? Like, what are some of the ways that we can get started? Yeah, there's a few ways. I mean, I think that when we're talking just about giving, like giving money, um, and it is often a new concept depending on where you've come from. Um, one thing I always tell people about giving is it is not about giving a lot. Like I think people have it in their heads. It means they have to give a lot. Mm -hmm. And in reality, what I always say, especially like, people do come and ask me, even my parents beginning of last year were like, can we have a call with you about our giving plan? <laughs> I was like, sure. And it's because they're like, we don't have tons to give and we want to give to a bunch of organizations. And I said, we'll just give them all $10 a month. Then. Like, that's all you have to do. Um, and so my advice for people around giving specifically always is that it is not about the amount. It's about the fact that you said, maybe today I go without that coffee and I can give this over. It's, it's, it's being um, mindful about what, and oftentimes small amount you can hand over and then just doing it. 
the other ways to give are really important too. So one is volunteering, volunteering for organizations, charities, nonprofits. We never have enough staff. We always need support. So whatever skills you have, they're typically welcome at most charities, nonprofits, and they'll figure out ways to work with you. Um, and then sharing on social media, like we, you know, we have no marketing money. So <laughs> like we're always, we're always trying to get people to share information about our organization and in as many spaces as we can and it's free and it's easy and all you have to do is repost things and share them so i think those are some very easy ways to give back that go a long way wow and uh so how my last question and i promise it's the final question <laughs> is how do we um uh follow you and your work yeah, well, for a network for change is on LinkedIn. So definitely go and find it there. We're on Instagram as well. You can find us there too. Um, Facebook, Twitter, again, like going to all of those spaces goes a long way. And then um, we don't send out tons of newsletters. So I always tell people go and sign up for our newsletter. You won't be getting one from us every day. You won't even get one from us once a week. <laughs> when you get them from us, they're for very specific things and they help share what we're, what we're working on and what people need to know. So those are just some easy ways to go and get involved with our work. Mm -hmm. And now for our live stream audiences, our um, live stream assistant already post all for us work, all the organizations, pictures, um, website, linking, Instagram, everything on the chat box. <laughs> so you can just excellent <laughs> <laughs> so um heather i had such a great conversation tonight it's already one one hour time i know it went by quick. quick oh my god so um i really do hope um you can come back to our we working women platform and maybe just offer some mentorship and some you know training for our young professionals and some newcomers that really need some of your um like insight and your experience and your hope Yes, I would love to do that. That would be a privilege for me. All right. Thank you so much for tonight. Um, thank you for all the audience tonight who are watching on live stream. We have 1,200 more people are watching us <laughs> tonight on just the, um, the Chinese website. So uh, it's very exciting. I hope everybody get a lot of um, advices and insights from Heather. And we're looking forward to help you back. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone, and uh, good morning to those who are in China. <laughs> morning to all of you. <laughs> all right. Bye.